July 15th, we are 49 and 49. We are eight games out of first place in our division. That said, because of how the wins and losses are distributed in the American League, we currently occupy a wild card spot. So that is something to keep in mind as we move forward into the trade deadline in a couple of weeks. This has been a weird team. It's been a weird season. We've lost Tamar Johnson for two months. He's been gone for five weeks now. We lost Ethan Petrie for the year pretty early. We lost Shimizu for a bulk of the season. And yet, somehow, some way, we find a way to win about as many games as we lose. And one thing that has not been helping is our bullpen. Our bullpen ERA is 10th in the league. This is unlike us. This is unlike the type of team that we have built. And so I've got a couple moves that will hopefully help us improve the bullpen a bit going into the second half. And we'll start with Steve Forrestal. This is someone who we traded for and then traded away in the same offseason. He's now on the Cardinals, except he isn't because he has been waived. So Steve Forrestal is on the waivers alongside uh, current Cincinnati Red, 36 years old, Ron Marinaccio. And Ron Marinaccio was pitching very well, so I'm surprised that the Reds waived him. But we're going to put in the claim on both of these guys. I think maybe Forrestal will start in AAA for us. Uh, but Marinaccio will probably join us in the big leagues right away just because he's been pitching really well. We have three All-Stars this year. It's about who you would expect. Tyler Pitzer is going to start the All-Star game for the American League. That is very exciting. This has been one of the best pitching seasons we have seen so far in this save. I wonder if he could possibly be in contention for a Cy Young Award come uh, the end of the season. Chase Lee is an All-Star. That is the one that's a little bit surprising to me. He has done well. I will give him credit. He has done well. I'm fine with him being our closer. It's really just the rest of the bullpen, which has been an issue. And Daniel Cuvé is an all-star. He is OPSing nearly 1,000. You can see he's just having a terrific season this year, a breakout season after what was a miserable 2030. We stuck with him, and in 2031, he has been much better, our 2026 first-round pick. Also, American League All-Stars are a lot of guys who swapped teams this offseason. That includes uh, Samuel Basayo, who is now of the Red Sox. That includes Carson Williams of the Yankees, who is having an absolutely monster year. He could be an MVP contention, it seems. Corbin Carroll, now of the Rangers, also an All-Star. In the National League, we're moving over here. Who's going to start for the National League? It is going to be CJ Sampson. That is that two-way player we have talked about. This guy is... Uh, wow, this guy's a really cool player, man. I, I wish we had him. Uh, Ken Pepin. Who I've talked about before, he is uh, going to be the best pitcher in uh, Rockies franchise history. No, no offense to Herman Marquez or those who came before him. Uh, having a monster season is also Jake Kingston, the reigning rookie of the year for the Philadelphia Phillies. That guy is a terrific player as well. So he did get forced all, but somehow Marinaccio fell through. Like, uh, I put a claim in on him. Maybe I'm not allowed to put in two claims at once, but he was successfully DFA'd. He's now in AAA. I don't like that whatsoever. July 27th, we are 53 and 52. Some bad news on Somei Shimizu, who we are hoping to get back from injury. Uh, he has suffered a setback in terms of his recovery from ulnar nerve entrapment, so he is not going to pitch again this year, it appears. Now, due to miss two to three more months, this was originally supposed to be a two or three month injury to begin with. So that is a bummer. I think that's probably going to be the end of Shimizu's season. And uh, that is good information to have, though, going into the trade deadline. One guy who will not be factoring into the rotation at any point in the season as well is Pete Barker. Pete Barker, one of the prospects we received in the Vinny Pasquantino trade, put him up in AAA this year, made 10 starts there. He has suffered a ruptured bicep tendon. That sounds incredibly painful, and that is going to end his season as well. July 30th it is the day before the trade deadline. We are 53 and 55. If you were wondering if this is a buy or sell moment, it is absolutely a buy because thanks to the distribution of wins in what appears to be a rather weak American League this year, we are only one game out of a wild card spot, trailing Tampa. So, it is time to buy, and I think the things I'm going to be targeting are we need a bat and we need bullpen help. We have got our bat. It is going to come courtesy of the rebuilding Baltimore Orioles. They are going to send us Mark Cox. Mark Cox is a contact-oriented infielder. He's listed as a first baseman here, but I consider him someone who could play first, second, or third. That's good. We need that. We need some infield help for sure. In return, we're going to send away Gage Harrelson, who's been a 40-man option for us uh, as an outfielder. Eric Kane is uh, someone who is my 18th round draft pick in 2027, having a good year in A-ball this year, so I guess that's why they won him. Chris O'Brien was a minor league signing. He's playing in high A. He's a non-factor for me. And then Jeremy Hertel was my 2027 16th rounder. So I don't think it's necessarily a huge investment to get Mark Cox, but Mark Cox has proven he can at least hit a little bit. 
you can see actually, let's look at his MLB stats. He's a career 114 W, sorry, not WRC plus, OPS plus in Major League Baseball in his career so far. So if he can just hit a little for us, uh, you know, this is a lineup that is ready to improve with the addition of someone like Mark Cox. So that's going to be their first trade of the deadline. We got our bat. We need our bullpen help, and it's going to come in a trade with the Arizona Diamondbacks. Welcome back to the fold, Spencer Arigetti. Spencer Arigetti signed himself a one-year deal with the Diamondbacks for not a lot of money, and he has pitched well out of the rotation for them, although I imagine he'll most likely be in the bullpen for us. We also get Dylan Watts, who is their closer. He has about a three ERA this year as well. This is to help the bullpen. And in order to help the bullpen, we're actually going to trade away from the bullpen. We're going to trade away Hurston Waldrip, who has great ratings, but it's just never really gotten it together for us. He has a career 4.60 ERA in an Oakland A's uniform. That is not very good. He would probably be a non-tender candidate with his salary being $3 million right now. So that's the deal we're going to do. Hopefully in the short term, it'll help us out. We're going to get Watts. We're going to get Eric Getty back, and we're going to trade away Hurston Waldrip to the Arizona Dimebacks. For our third and final trade of the deadline, we are going to bring back some old friends as well, Eric Ackerman and Cam Kemeniti, both of whom were in the Jared Jones and Tamar Johnson trade from this past offseason. I liked both those guys. Those were the guys that hurt to let go. I'm going to bring them back. Kamenetti, by the way, has been a nice starter this year, so that adds an option to the rotation as well, potentially, or as the highest leverage guy in the bullpen. He can do both. He's only 24. White Sanford, David Ambrez, G Jesus Zakatenko, and Juan Baca are going away in this trade. Sanford is, uh, has been our shortstop uh, for a lot of the year, kind of in a platoon with Albertus. Hasn't performed particularly well. Getting Ackerman back, I'm fine with losing Sanford. Ambrez and Zakatenko and Baca. These guys are all sort of late round picks uh, that uh, have done well in the minors, but I don't really think have, you know, huge big league aspirations necessarily. So I'm very happy with this trade. Of all the trades I'm making, this is the one I'm most happy about. I'm glad to get Cam Caminiti back and Ackerman back. And we're going to go ahead and make this trade and trudge forward into the last couple months of the season. One corresponding move I'm going to make, I'm going to send down Andrew Wiggins to AAA. He does have an option. And he's just been playing bad for us this year. A 69 OPS plus, negative one war. He needs some time in AAA. Shea Whitcomb has been filling in for us as well. We are going to send him down to AAA. I don't believe he's going to take that, though. I don't think he has an option. Uh, no, no, he does. Okay, so down to AAA he goes as well. And finally, I'm going to option Salcedo back down to the minors to make room for some of the pitching we have acquired. And I'll also be optioning down Frank Trejo. This is his third year with us. He's been making $2 million per year each of those years, and he's ARB eligible. So that's probably the end of him. So heading into the last couple months of the season, down just one game in the wildcard race to the Tampa Bay Rays. Here's how we'll line up. It's not really platoony at all. All we're going to do is move down Dave Sochi versus the lefties. So what you see is what you get there. Baker leads off. Tovar is going to play second base for now with Ackerman playing shortstop. Keep in mind, Tamar Johnson will be back in four days when that happens. Tamar will play second, and uh, Ackerman will get benched as Tovar shifts over back to shortstop. Mark Cox is going to play third base for us. That moves Cuvay over to first, and that's how we're going to do the lineup. The rotation, we've inserted Cam and Nitty for now. I do want to talk about the pitching setup because that was kind of a headache for me. I've decided to put Caminiti into the rotation. He would be also awesome in that high leverage stopper role that we used him in last year, but I think he has proven that he has earned a spot in this rotation. That's going to come at the cost of Eric Segura for now. Eric Segura has the worst F4 out of any of our starting pitchers, or at least F4 pace. Uh, Adam Mako has just been absolutely on fire. You would think Adam Mako would be the odd man out here, but he has been absolutely on fire. He is on a tear. I'm going to leave him in for that tear. If he falters, though, it'll be Segura. Or if Seth Johnson falters further, it will also be Segura. So Segura is going to be in that long relief role. It's not going to be like that Frank Trejo role either, like he's going to pitch for us. It's just, you know, in, even in the higher leverage spots. As far as the bullpen goes, we got Spencer, Nallin, and Lopez, the lefties in middle relief. And Eric Getty is also going to be in middle relief for us. Keep in mind, he has been starting for Arizona, uh, but he's going to be in middle relief for us with a use more often designation. Our bullpen stoppers are going to be Uyola, who's going to be sort of akin to the seventh inning guy. Watts, who we just traded for. Arizona's closer. He's going to be the eighth inning guy. And Chase Lee remains the ninth inning guy. This is how we'll set up. I'm excited about these last two months. I'm hopefully, and hopefully these moves will uh, propel us to a playoff spot.
This is the prospect check-in for August 1st, 2031. We'll start with Alexis Kaye. A torn calf muscle has unfortunately ended his season prematurely. This is someone who we were really excited to get a few years ago back in that 2028 class but he hasn't quite panned out, hasn't quite developed how we wanted him to, though he remains only 19 years old. I also want to check in on Kevin Skeet in injury news because he does have an elbow strain, so in case you're wondering if you, he was going to factor into uh, you know, the bullpen or the rotation or anything like that, not yet. I don't think he will make his big league debut for us in light of some of the trades we've made. He'll have to wait until next year. These guys, Ariaga Cowan and Chris Rangel, who are first rounder, we're still waiting on them to sign, but there's no, you know, budgetary issues preventing us from doing that. I think we're fine in that regard. We're just waiting for them to sign. Good news for Mike Drake. Mike Drake has done extremely well since his promotion to high A. He is now the nine, number 98th a ranked prospect in the league. He was our 2029 second rounder. I am super excited about Mike Drake. I was thinking about bumping, bumping him up to double uh, A, but we will wait. He's only 20, so we will wait for that promotion to double A. Uh, someone who did get a promotion to double A is Liddell Hungo or Hungo. That was our 2030 sixth rounder, a shortstop prospect. Ratings have come down a little bit for him. There was a time where I was really stoked on him and thought maybe he was going to be the shortstop of the future. Don't quite think that's going to happen, but he could be another, you know, Ackerman or Guevara type. Those are the types of players I like at shortstop anyways, it appears. Daniel Arana is a slightly better version of that. He has not done well in AAA. He will not factor into the big league club this year. Sergio Treviso has earned himself a promotion to AA. So this is the guy who got hurt last year, and it cut his season short. Look at what he did in A, and then look at what he did in high A. Absolutely on a roll. He gets a promotion to AA, and he could be a factor in our outfield someday. I'm excited about him. He was our, let's get that right, 2028 second rounder. And finally, I do want to talk about Chris Bre Chris Greer and Jared Forrest, two former first-round picks for us, Greer in 2026. He looks like he could factor into the future of this team, honestly. The ranks have come along. The potential ranks have come along. He looks like he could maybe hit. He has not hit that well in AAA. I don't think he's going to be a factor this year beyond the five games he played out of desperation for us. And then Jared Forrest uh, has moved up from AA uh, an excellent second season in the pros after a poor pro debut, and we're excited about him. And with Jaden Melendez not exactly tearing it up, I think he is making a push to be the catcher next year. I'm saying next year. I'm not going to uh, factor him in, him in this year, but next year for sure. Skeet, Forrest, Greer, maybe even Barker, Arana factors into the team. So that's exciting. August 3rd, we are one game out, tied with the Rays, one game behind the Twins, and Termar Johnson is back. He is going to play second base and bat third. That's going to kick Tovar over to shortstop and Ackerman into a utility role. And Jade Melendez will bat ninth. And Tamar Johnson is immediately diagnosed with dead arm after like how many games? Three games. And will be out for a week. All right. August 11th, the injuries and losses are both piling up. We are 56 and 62, still only two games out of a wildcard spot. Josh Mears is out for four days. Daniel Cuvet is out for two weeks. We'll have to add Cuvet to the injured list. These injuries have certainly stacked up for us, and here's how we're going to line up for the time being before these guys come back. Carter Jensen, I've called up from AAA to be our designated hitter. He was raking in AAA on a minor league deal. A catcher by trade, but a DH for us right now. Ackerman, shortstop, and Vance Honeycutt, who's been sort of our fourth or fifth outfielder, will get starts in center, while Baker gets starts in right, and Sochi gets starts in left. August 15th, Mears and Johnson are back in the lineup, still waiting Cuvée. That's going to be another week. We are 57 and 64. We have not been on a good stretch since the trade deadline. That said, still only two and a half games off of a wild card spot somehow. The American League is really, really, really bad. But we're going to need to get hot, and we haven't been able to put together our full post trade deadline lineup because of some of these injuries. August 19th here, we are 59 and 66. We need to get hot. We are three games behind. Vance Honeycutt is injured with diagnosis pending. He is currently our fourth outfielder. Cuvet has five days left before he comes back from the fractured foot and hopefully gives this lineup a kick in the rear end. But the pitching is doing well. We won today versus the Cubs. Jared Jones, a no-hitter. A no-hitter versus the Chicago Cubs. Did it on 115 pitches, three walks, six strikeouts. Honeycutt's injury is a strained shoulder. That is a four-week injury. We're going to add him to the injured list. The call-up will be Michael Ciani, another guy who can just play the defense. We need someone who can play center besides Baker in a pinch, and that is going to be Ciani. 
August 24th now, we are 61 and 68, three and a half games back, but we finally have a normal lineup again. We have Cox at third, we have Mears in the lineup, we have Cuvet back in the cleanup spot where he belongs. Everybody is ready to go. Let's get hot. And on August 30th, we do get hot. We have won seven in a row. We are now 66 and 68, but still three games back because the Rangers and the Rays have decided to make this wild card race somewhat respectable in the American League. September 1st is roster expansion. I'm going to call up Frank Trejo, and I'm also going to call up Andrew Wiggins. These are both guys who were sent down post-trade deadline. Rough start to September here. We have lost four in a row. We are now four and a half out of that wild card spot. And Eric Segura is out. He'll be out for four to five weeks. That's probably going to end his regular season. Salcedo will be the corresponding call-up. The wheels have sort of fallen off for us here in September. We have lost six in a row. We are 67 and 74, five games off that wild card with not a lot of games left to play. I believe only 21 games left here in the season. September 13th, time for some good news, bad news. Good news is we've won some games. We're 72 and 75, now only two games out, so we could still be relevant here till the very end. Unfortunately, we'll have to do it without Mark Cox. Mark Cox, a sprained ankle out two to three weeks. That was one of the bats we acquired at the deadline. We liked him for the positional versatility, and we're about to lose that. Cox will go to the injured list. And believe it or not, the call-up is actually going to be none other than Chris Greer because he has gotten insanely hot in AAA, and I think we could use his bat in the majors for the time being. So it looks like Chris Greer is going to play first base for us. He's going to have to be our savior as we slide Cuvet back over to third. September 15th, this is a really dramatic point in this save. We are 74 and 75. We are one game behind. We've won a couple games here against the Angels, but... The scariest injury scare you could possibly imagine. Tyler Pitzer, our Cy Young candidate, our ace, is pending with a leg injury. Thankfully, not an arm injury, but a leg injury. If it's a, you know, uh, I don't know what it could be, but I am scared to death. Let us sim forward. Out five to six weeks. That will end his season. A strained hamstring. We will have to do it without Pitzer. We will have to do it without Segura. We will have to continue doing it without Shimizu in the rotation. We stand here at the precipice. The injuries have taken so much from us, and yet we can seize our own destiny. We can create a moment. We can call up Kevin Skeet. And we get swept by the Red Sox. Kevin Skeet makes his debut versus the Angels and pitches six scoreless innings, grabs the win in his debut. But with a 78 and 79 record, three games behind that third wild card spot, it is going to take a miracle because we only have five games left to play, and those five games are coming against the Rangers and the Astros, the best teams in the division. We will go game by game. We get hammered 13 to 2 in the first game as we drop to 78 and 80. We lose again at Texas, this time 10 to 7. The magic number for the Twins is 1. They will be playing against the Texas Rangers as we take on the Houston Astros in the final series of the season. And we will lose 2-0 versus the Astros. We are officially eliminated from contention, and we have officially clinched yet another losing season. We end the season with our 79th win. So close, and yet so far, I can't help but wonder what this season would have been if not for the injuries. We finished 79 and 83, but I can't help but feel we left a lot on the table, and maybe that's a good thing. Maybe that's something that gives us hope for next year. For example, we were 7th in OPS, but 12th in runs scored. So maybe if we can be 7th in runs scored, that'll make a difference. Look at our run differential. 706 runs scored, 691 runs allowed. So we were actually plus 15 in terms of the run differential. I don't think we've run a positive run differential yet this year. Starters ERA was excellent. Bullpen ERA was something we really struggled with. Our bullpen was not as good as it's been in past years. I think that's part of the reason why we actually underperformed our run differential because of that bullpen potentially. But yeah, looking at this lineup right here, Chris Baker, I think had a good second year. I mean, I'd actually say great. I mean, 800 OPS, 120 OPS plus, 4.6 war. I'll just take a look at the lineup right here. We can sort by OPS. Baker had a big year. Tovar, when he played, he was good, 122 OPS+. plus. He's got that expensive team option coming up. That's going to be something to decide for us. Tamar Johnson was good when he played, uh, but he didn't play every game. He missed a couple months there, and Kuve just a huge breakout year for him. It was good to see. I actually considered trading him uh, this past offseason. I'm glad I didn't do it. Otherwise, we did have some underperformance. Dave Sochi, I think, could have been better. 
That said, I think he wants to uh, stick around for the team. I, I still have him in the plans for this team long term. One player I'm not sure I have in the long term plans nowadays is Josh Mears with 234 strikeouts. Uh, he's you know declined since 2029, that breakout year. 2030, he had a eh year, and this year I would say this was a bad year for Josh Mears. Here's what his contract looks like the rest of the way. It'd be interesting to see what kind of trade value he has. Our lineup probably would have been better if we had Ethan Petrie in there. He only appeared in 33 games for us this year. Wasn't great in those 33 games, but I felt like maybe he could have turned things around. Mark Cox is someone who I am actually fond of nowadays, and he may have a long-term place in this team playing either third base or second base. I'll have to sort of figure that out as we roll into the offseason. I do want to shout out, obviously, the starting rotation. Shimizu, who was supposed to be our ace, only made nine starts, and they weren't nine very good starts at all. But Tyler Pitzer, man, an ERA crown, he does qualify with 166 innings pitched and uh, really could have been, I think, a Cy Young contender if he had gotten hurt for those last couple starts. We'll just have to see, but he does get an ERA crown. That is huge. Jared Jones was absolutely massive. Cam Caminiti, who we traded for at the deadline, uh, pretty good for us as a starting pitcher. Glad we got him back. Seth Johnson had a fine year, but he's gone. His his contract's up. He's gone. Adam Mako, I should have shouted out more, honestly. The people will be talking about the Adam Mako Lynn Sanity run from a minor league free agent signing to 23 great starts for us. He's a free agent. He's not coming back, but uh, he will get paid elsewhere. And Kevin Skeet finished in the rotation. Also, shout out Eric Segura. A perfectly fine year with a 3.88 ERA. The bullpen was a different story, however. The bullpen was not great this year. One of those was actually Dylan Watts, who we acquired at the deadline. Not nearly as good for us as he was for Arizona, where he was the closer. Chase Lee and Jalen Nallen were definitely our best relievers, but even their best wasn't as good as some of the best we've seen in the past, like from Caminiti and, of course, Ronan Cobb. We have not properly replaced those guys necessarily in the bullpen. Here's what the playoff picture looks like, and we are ready to begin those playoffs once again, they'll be without the Oakland A's, but I just can't help but feel like we're getting closer. The Braves, Nationals, and Rangers will advance out of these wildcard series, and it will be the Twins joining them. We move on to these division series. These are best of five series, first to three games wins. Uh, Braves and Brewers are split. Nationals and Phillies are split, while the Tigers and Red Sox will take game one over there in the American League. Simming through now. Braves and Nationals will take Game 2. Red Sox have a 2-0 lead on the Twins. This series is split 1-1, and the Braves will advance. This will go to a Game 5, and the Red Sox will advance. And we will have another Game 5 in the American League as well. Tigers, Rangers, Nationals, Phillies. It'll be the Nationals advancing in the National League, and the Rangers advancing in the American League. So let's meet these final four teams. The Rangers are in the American League, and I hate to say it, but we actually had the same Pythag expected win-loss as they did. We had very similar results in terms of the run differential, although we did it very differently. This is an offense first team. Their offense was excellent this year. They were powered by Carter, Seeger, Carroll, who was their new signing, Wyatt Langford, of course. And they also have this guy, Yun Ki Yao, a uh, Taiwanese DH, who I avoided mentioning earlier because of the 30 avoid case. And he did strike out 199 times in 518 plate appearances. That's like a 40K rate or like a 38K rate, which is just insane. But he also hit 41 home runs because of that 75 power that led to a 141 OPS plus. Pitching, not much to write home about. They actually have Mason Miller starting for them, uh, which is interesting because he has not made a start all year. He has only pitched out of the bullpen uh, after a trade from the Blue Jays to the Rangers. They have Dustin May, Edward Cabrera, and Walker Buehler as well. But just as a whole, this has not been an impressive team in terms of run prevention. They allowed 832 runs this year. Those Rangers will face the Red Sox, who won the East. They took it away from the Yankees, who had a terrific start to the regular season, but slowed down, and the Red Sox ended up winning 95 games. They're powered by about who you would expect to see them powered by at this point. Devers is still here, but he's kind of made way for Miguel Blase and Roman Anthony, and even Marcelo Meyer, who is their superstar shortstop, but they're going to have to do it without him because he is hurt. Sadon Rafael is in the fold, playing second base for them, so he is uh, back where he belongs, and he had a not-so-good 2030 with us, did better when we traded him to Washington, and now he's great for the Red Sox, so that one kind of stings. I guess he just wasn't a good fit. They are powered by their ace, Garrett Crochet. He's been one of the better pitchers in this simulation. They also have Matt Brash, who is the reigning Cy Young Award winner, although not nearly as good this year as he was the previous year. And the closer, Wusuk Go, is their star in the bullpen. 
The National League is going to feature this Braves team, which has some serious injuries in the rotation. Spencer Strider, they got him back on a two-year deal, right? No, one-year deal. He's hurt. His injury proneness is wrecked. It's very sad to see what he has become. Max Fried, who is 37 now, is still a Brave. Here's his contract, and uh, he is injured as well. He is also wrecked. So these two, who are sort of the stars for the Braves in real life, not going to factor into this series. Justin Steele, Mike Fix, Peyton Toll, and Kevin Kelly are in the rotation. You can see those ERAs. That is not a strength. The strength for them is definitely the lineup. They still have Riley doing Riley things. They still have Michael Harris doing Michael Harris things. They still have Acuna doing Acuna things. But even some of the newcomers like Nacho Alvarez is definitely factoring in here. He's great at getting on base. You'll recall they have Volpe, who was a little bit better this year. Actually, you know what? 2030 had a good year. It was 2029 the year that he really struggled, but he's been pretty good 2030, 2031, but it is a big contract with a few years left to go for Anthony Volpe. They also have Kyle Manzardo and Randy Rosarena. This is a very deep lineup all the way. And their closer is Abner Uribe. They'll face off against their division rival Nationals, but they'll have to do it without James Wood, who I think, I seriously think, just based on the ratings, I think James Wood is the best player in this simulation, but he is unfortunately out with a strained groin that he suffered in early September. Still going to be out for two more weeks. We should talk about C.J. Sampson, who is this absolute monster uh, two-way player they have. Look at his offensive numbers, 5.2 war. Wow, he had a 10-war season if you factor in his F4 right here. Keep in mind the pitching is based on F4, so even though from a run prevention perspective his ERA doesn't look that great, his ratios and strikeouts, walks and home runs, I mean this is a 10-war two-way season. This is this is the new Shohei. He's only 24 years old. He is the new Shohei, and he plays third base, so he plays the field as well when he is hitting. So that is all very exciting. They do have Ronan Kopp as well. And as you can kind of see, attempts to make Ronan Kopp a starter have not worked out well. And some of his ratings have even come down, so I think that has had a negative effect on him. So it's kind of a shame to see what has become of Ronan Cobb. Ethan Petrie, who is one of the key guys we got back, and that trade has not done well either. So that trade's been just kind of a bust overall. Oh, and yeah, and by the way, they do have Dylan Cruz. Those are the teams that are left. We'll move on here to the championship series. The Braves take a 2-0 lead. The Red Sox take a 1-0 lead against the Rangers. 2-0 for both of those teams now. Nationals will take Game 3 over here in the American League. Let's see what happens. The Red Sox take Game 3, so they're in the driver position, as are the, as are the Braves. 3-0, 3-1. The Braves will advance. The Rangers will force a Game 5, but it will be the Red Sox that advance. So we're looking at a Red Sox-Braves World Series, two of the oldest franchises in the land. And it will be the Red Sox taking Game 1. Red Sox taking game two. They have been on fire this postseason. I think they've only dropped one game yet, but they've only dropped one game so far. And we'll move on with the Red Sox taking game three as well. And they sweep a dominant postseason run for the Boston Red Sox. They are World Series champions in 2031. The Red Sox finish them off in game four by winning in extras. They win an 11-inning thriller. Wu Suk Go closes it down. And Charlie Condon is your World Series MVP. You'll recall that he was traded in a straight swap. It was him for Kyle Teal. That was a pretty dramatic trade, a swap of two pretty similar players. And uh, Charlie Condon is going to end up as the World Series MVP after a somewhat disappointing regular season, but he is now a free agent. Thank you for watching this episode. It was definitely a fascinating episode, a fascinating second half to the season, and hopefully we can build on this momentum going into the offseason.